Well, a lot happened this year at the year 2022, and we are going to recap the biggest stories. And we have a lot to say, a lot to talk about, a lot to recap, some things that we didn't even remember happened. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use promo code Allie at checkout. GoodRanchers.com, code Allie. Okay, guys, welcome to Relatable. Hope everyone is having a wonderful week in the holiday season and happy almost new year. This has been almost just a blur of a year, kind of like 2021 and 2022. So much has happened. And my team and I just wanted to recap some of the major things. It was really hard to narrow down what we wanted to talk about today, because there are so many different stories, so many different viral tweets and memes and clips and all of that stuff. And so we probably won't even be able to get to everything that we want to get to. We literally have 52 pages (laughs) of things and stories. And even in these pages, we probably don't have all of the stories that you're thinking of that you thought were the most impactful. Also, there were a few stories that I had put into this document like, oh, we need to talk about this. This was a big thing that happened this year that I was told. Like, for example, I said, oh, we need to talk about the Nick Cannon story when he called white people subhuman or said something bad about Jewish people. That literally happened in 2020. So like I said, the past few years have been a blur because so much is happening all the time. But we're going to just recap. This kind of helps us get our bearings. It helps kind of orient us, reminds us what year it is. And we can kind of have closure on this craziness as we head into 2023. So I thought it'd be fun to just kind of discuss. Uh, My team is here. We've got, I'll reintroduce them. We've got Kayla, who is director of the show. And then we've got Bree, who is the producer. And then we've got Dylan, who is the assistant producer and editor extraordinaire doing lots of things. And they're not the only people on this team. We have a couple more people who help, but they're not here. So they will um, also be discussing some of these things with us. All right, let's get started with what happened in January. Again, one of those things that I could not recall whether it happened last year or this year. And that is the Freedom Convoy. The Freedom Convoy happened in Canada. And these were truckers who were protesting the vaccine mandates. So let me read you a little bit about this. In January, a group of Canadian truckers decided to convoy across the country to protest vaccine passports, school mask mandates, and school vaccine requirements. And these people were demonized by Justin Trudeau, the head of Canada, who literally said that these people were misogynist and they were racist. They're people that the rest of Canada doesn't want to share a country with. These were peaceful protesters, by the way. We had, I believe we had a protester on this show. I know that we had a guest who talked to us about what the Freedom Convoy was, what they were standing for, how they were peaceful. We definitely saw videos circulating at the time of family members singing worship songs, eating by the fire, simply trying to take a stand for freedom. And what did Justin Trudeau do? He not only demonized them and otherized, marginalized these peaceful protesters, actually said that they were an inhibition to freedom, because up is down in this Orwellian world in which we live, this dystopian madness in which we are forced to dwell. Uh, But he also made more than, the police made more than 30 arrests, issued more than 1,300 tickets, and conducted over 75 criminal investigations in connection with the demonstrations. And not only that, but they seized fuel, they cut off material, financial, and logistical support to what they called the occupation. Police also warned of arrests and charges for anyone transporting diesel and other fuels to demonstrators downtown who were idle their trucks to keep warm. So they're going to starve them out. They're going to freeze them out. Um, On February 4th, GoFundMe shut down the organizer's money-raising drive, who was organizing the Freedom Convoy, adding it would distribute refunds to donors. We now have evidence from law enforcement that the previously peaceful demonstration has become an occupation. That was just a phrase that the Canadian government was using. 
Yeah, they were peacefully protesting to try to get the attention of the Canadian government to say we don't want to stand for this anymore. So here is a clip of this very scary, apparently, occupation that was going on by the Freedom Convoyers in Canada. Okay, so you've got all different kinds of people there. I know that they were saying, oh, they're just these white misogynists, blah, 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 which, by the way, it wouldn't have been, it, it, it would be okay if they were all white men, by the way, that doesn't negate or diminish the credibility of the protest at all, but it actually wasn't. It was, there were all kinds of people. Um, they were uh, Native people there. There were Muslim people there. There were old and young and all different, poor and rich, all different kinds of people of all different occupations. What you saw right there was simply a peaceful protest. If you want to see what a violent occupation looks like, you can come down to the United States and you can see the different zones that Antifa and Black Lives Matter set up in places like Portland and Seattle, where people were literally murdered because the police were not allowed in these occupation zones. Like that was happening in the United States and not even Trump was willing to send in, uh, you know, send in any kind of federal law enforcement to break this to break this up, which I think he should have because it was a matter of public safety. And so if you want to see an occupation, you can look at what the left does down here. And I mean, these people were literally and figuratively trampled upon, like their freedom was trampled upon, but they were literally, in some cases, trampled by the police riding horses. Here's a clip of that. that Literally, the police, the Canadian police, trampling over peaceful protesters. I think it was, at the time, uh, I believe that it was, uh, a, it was reported that a woman in a walker an older woman in a walker was actually trampled by the Canadian police. We like to forget this. We like to forget that this happened in the West. This is not China. All right. This is not North Korea. This is not Russia. This was happening in Canada. That's what happens when your like chief value is being nice. I'm not saying this is true of all Canadians. Obviously, there are a lot of Canadians that didn't want to put up with this tyranny. But I think those uh, Canadians who care about freedom would agree with me that when your chief value and characteristic as a nation, as a society is nice, then that leads to widespread compliance. I mean, we have a similar problem here in the United States. Some of the people who say that they value kindness the most are the most intolerant people of dissent. Also, I just want to say one thing about Canada and a story that went on there, and I don't know when it was debunked this year, but it happened sometime this year. Remember when we heard, I believe it was last year, about how all of those like native children were secretly mass murdered and that they, their mass graves were underneath these churches. And so these activists in Canada burned these churches down in an act of vengeance. And then the whole thing was debunked that they weren't actually mass graves, that we don't actually know the truth about how uh, children died. They might have been some kind of burial site, but this idea that these churches were built on the mass graves of children that they killed, that there was just like no proof to support that. And yet these churches were burned down. And from what we saw from the Canadian government, there was uh, very little, if any, condemnation from these activists. So that's the typical double standard that we've got. All right, let's move on to February. February, of course, was Ukraine. And you know what? This is just kind of like a complicated subject. And so because I don't feel like I have the expertise to break this down, I wanted to bring on someone who does um, who just can explain complicated things so clearly in, in such a sophisticated way. And that, of course, is our vice president, Kamala Harris. So here she is. So Ukraine is a country in Europe. It exists next to another country called Russia. Russia is a bigger country. Russia is a powerful country. Russia decided to invade a smaller country called Ukraine. So basically, that's wrong. 
Okay, thank you so much, Kamala Harris. That breaks it down for us. Um, now, you might remember at the time, like how quickly this became, um, how quickly this became the biggest story, the highest priority. And it became the thing like COVID and vaccines that you were not allowed to question. People immediately put Ukrainian flags in their bio. People started hanging Ukrainian flags um, outside of their homes. Now, the footage in the news stories that we were getting from Ukraine, I mean, they were absolutely awful. We saw a lot of violence. We saw a lot of women and children have to flee. There were a lot of funds that needed to be raised. There were a lot of people who needed to be rescued. And that was real. That was real. People were fleeing Ukraine, innocent people, because of the violence. But immediately, Zelensky was hoisted up as some kind of hero. There was no question, apparently, about like how important this was or where this went on the list of priorities uh, for Americans. And there was no allowance for any questioning for why Democrats and a lot of Republicans suddenly cared more about the sovereignty of a country that most people can't point to on a map than they do the sovereignty of our own country. Why did they care more about Ukraine's borders than our own borders? If you question something like that, then you were labeled as pro-Putin and pro-Russia propaganda or, you know, some kind of propagandizing fascist, whatever it was. But there were some people who were willing to ask those questions and say, why all of a sudden do we consider Zelensky a hero? Why are we all of a sudden putting all of our eggs into Ukraine's basket, knowing how corrupt that country is? I mean, that is a corrupt country. Not to say that we should be on the side of Putin, not to say that we should be on the side of a dictatorship, but acting like uh, Ukraine is objectively and exclusively virtuous and that this is a fight that Americans must prioritize over the domestic problems that we have. That was what was crazy. That was what was crazy at the time. And uh, you got a lot of really strange responses to that, just like really intense responses to anyone questioning this from uh, from the left. Uh, the Federalist reported on this. Democrats have been unbearable in flaunting their self-righteousness on the issue of Ukraine. I guess that's what it is with that with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi reading a poem written by U2 frontman Bono on St. Patrick's Day uh, that pays tribute to Ukraine and the country's president, uh, Vladimir Zelensky. Oh, St. Patrick, he drove out the snakes with his prayers, but that's not all it takes. What the smoke symbolizes an evil that arises and hides in your heart as it breaks and the evil risen from the darkness that lives in some men, but in sorrow and fear, that's when saints can appear. You drive out these old snakes once again. Ireland's sorrow and pain is now with the Ukraine, and St. Patrick's name is now Zelensky. So that's the crazy part. I'm not saying you shouldn't have been praying for Ukraine or care about the Ukrainian people, but to like unquestioningly lift up this person as a saint, as a hero, um, is strange. And then we had a lot of fake news stories that were surrounding this because people saw this as their new way to be virtuous. You got the mask, you got the vaccine, the virtue of that is starting to wear off. And then you got, you had to be like all on board with every single thing that Ukraine did. So we had the ghost of Kiev. Uh, it was reported that there was some like Ukrainian plane that was patrolling the skies in Kiev and that he was killing all of these Russians and their Russian jets. But then there was no evidence whatsoever that the ghost of Kiev exists. It seemed to be Ukrainian propaganda, which we do think that Ukraine has been putting out some propaganda all this time. And so has um, so has Russia. Zelensky visiting the troops. Uh, there were um, videos and there were pictures being put out about Zelensky vo going to visit the Ukrainian troops. It turns out that those pictures were over a year old, but they were used again by Ukrainian media, media to kind of show, wow, look at our heroic leader. Um, there was this uh, power station explosion that happened uh, 
that happened or that we heard happened in Ukraine. And we were told that this probably was Russia, but it was actually a chemical plant that was exploding in China in 2000. Uh, 15. There were all different kinds of stories of this. And again, if you questioned anything at all about Ukraine, then you were told that you were pro-Putin, that you were pro-Russia, and you have to unapologetically and completely put Ukraine at the top of your priority list, even though our support for Ukraine, the billions and billions of dollars with basically no strings attached going over to Ukraine, has increased inflation here at home, has hurt our fuel prices uh, here at home. All of those things uh, Americans care a lot about because it comes down to being able to feed their families. And it's okay for you to care about your family. It's okay for you to care about your country first. That doesn't mean that you don't care about other countries. It's okay for you to prioritize your community, your family, and your country first. In fact, that's what good leaders are supposed to do. They're supposed to put your country and their citizens, their constituents first. Every single country's leaders should be putting the interest, the well-being, the safety and security of their people first. This administration and most of the people in Washington don't do that. We literally have an invasion at the southern border. They really don't care about that at all. We have a widespread crime problem and they don't seem to care about that very much. And yet they care much more, it seems, about the sovereignty and security of Ukraine. Also, you weren't supposed to question about Biden's family's ties to Ukraine um, that we have seen over the past few years. We did talk about all of that on the show, Um, took some blowback. But like most things on the left, like the narrative begins to unwind, more people start to be able to you know, be willing to open up and talk about that. We'll include the episodes that we did on these things in the description of this podcast if you want to go back and get a full refresher. All right, let's talk about March. Things start ramping up in March, especially when it comes to just like cultural stuff. So we got Will Smith. Remember that? Will Smith, during the Academy Awards, um, he decided that he was going to slap Chris Rock. Remember that? over something that Chris Rock said about Will Smith's wife. So let's play that clip just for memory's sake. (laughs) Oh, Oh, wow. Wow. Will Smith just smacked the shit out of me. Okay, so you didn't get to hear the joke, but the joke that he told, I mean, he made fun of Jada Pinkett Smith being bald because I think he said something about her being like uh, G.I. Jane and uh, Jada Pinkett Smith has alopecia. And so she has to shave her head because of that, because alopecia can make your hair fall out. And I guess Will Smith just didn't think that was funny, although he is or has been a comedian and a lot of those things are considered fair game. Like, I'm not saying it was a nice thing to say, but is it worth Will Smith getting up on the stage and literally slap punching Chris Rock for? I don't think so. And I remember the back and forth on Twitter about this, some saying, yes, you don't talk. And it was racialized immediately like you don't talk about a black man's woman or a black man's wife like that and when any white person inserted themselves into the dialogue they were like their wrist was slapped and told like white people shouldn't insert themselves into black people's business which is absolutely ridiculous like we share a country we share a culture we're watching the same award show like yes anyone of any background of any skin color has permission to talk about the things that happen that we all have our eyeballs on, all right? And so we're not going to start segregating these conversations um, by race, but that's just the clownery of the world in which we live right now. He actually was, Will Smith was punished by the Academy. I think he did end up uh, issuing an apology. So in an Academy meeting on April 8th, Smith was banned from attending the Oscars or any other Academy event for 10 years. Um, Guys back there, do you guys have any thoughts on the Will Smith thing? Did did you watch it live? Did you have any reaction to it? I did watch it live. Um, I mean, look, I don't know. Maybe this is not right, but I always hope there's some drama at events like that because they're just so uppity. Yeah. Um, Not that I wanted him to get slapped. 
obviously it was wrong. But <laughs> the other thing that frustrates me about this is that Jada Pinkett Smith talks about her alopecia all the time. And before that, she had been very open about it. So that was the other reason why people were confused why Will Smith all of a sudden decided that wasn't okay to talk about. Because it wasn't like she was, it was private. So Why do you think all of a sudden? Because there were like theories about... Because he, she also, I'm pretty sure, like, is open about cheating on Will Smith. And so I think yeah. some people were also like, why is he defending her so much? Yeah, they have apparently an open relationship, but it seems to be more open on her, her on end. Her end. <laughs> um, from what I've read, he doesn't, like, like it as much as she does. But Huh, that's so weird. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah. But I don't know. I think he's talked about it before. I don't know in detail, but I think he he's just said that, like, I, I just snapped and then, like, it's a yeah. lot of and some of the race stuff. I don't know. Yeah. I the Guardian. Know. The Guardian said white outrage about Will Smith slap is rooted in anti blackness. It's inequality in plain sight because, you know, I guess I su- are they saying like I would support a white guy slapping another <laughs> White guy, I'm not really sure. Forbes said, while talking about Will Smith's behavior, don't forget to also talk about the system that helped create it. So for some people, you don't have to take responsibility. You just don't have any agency, I guess. Yeah, there were a lot of people who were supporting Will entirely and saying that it's completely justified. Oh, you know what I remember now? This is what it was. I was thinking about this as I was talking. Glennon Doyle, who is like probably whose work is probably the number one driver of um, instability and selfishness and insecurity and narcissism and divorce in uh, suburban women. She had the audacity to say like violence should never be used as the proof of someone's love, which I, I agree with. Like I thought that that was a you know, a a good statement. I mean, I don't think it's always bad to like defend someone if you not, I don't think it's always bad to like, obviously like in self-defense, if someone is like attacking someone that you love, you obviously should be able to like fend them off physically. But I agree with her point that violence should not be someone's indication of love. And so she said that, she said a true thing. And then She kept it up, but she like edited her caption on Instagram and was like, you know what? I never should have inserted myself into this conversation as a white woman. There are clearly cultural things here that I don't understand. I'm going to leave this up as a learning opportunity. I'm like, oh my gosh, so exhausting to be like a white liberal woman. So exhausting. You can't even say things that are true because you apparently have to apply different standards to people based on the color of their skin. It's really sad. Um, all right. Uh, more in March. Dylan Mulvaney's rise to power. That's how it's phrased in my, in my outline. Um, all right. So he in March 2022... Dylan Mulvaney announced his transgender identity and started a TikTok Days of Girlhood series where he documented each day of his transition. And you've probably seen his clips going around. And if you're new here, I don't I don't use preferred pronouns. I use the pronouns that match someone's biology as long as we know um their biology because biology is not bigotry. I, if there's any value that I have, it's not lying. I will not live by lies. And um, so I will simply not play a part in that because I believe that that lie is what is the foundation for not just the destructive ideology, but also an ideology that is leading to the physical mutilation of children and of people who claim that they are confused and also the infringement upon the rights and the privacy and the fairness of women and girls. And so I'm just not going to play along with that. Dylan Mulvaney, he is, he plays a caricature of a girl. And so we have reacted to his clips where he is, oh my gosh, it's day whatever of being a girl and I'm scared of bugs or like whatever, like all of he's basically, he pretends to be 
a flusie. And this is a guy, he was a Broadway actor and singer, amazingly talented, amazingly talented, and decided that he not didn't just want to like transition so called into a woman, um, but into a girl. And he often dresses in very infantilizing ways, which I also think is creepy. Uh, he wears things that really like only little girls would wear, like the kind of pigtails and stuff that he wears. And so it's all very bizarre to me. It's all very offensive, um, of course, because you don't get to declare yourself or identify as something that you simply are not. And I actually don't, I, while I think that he probably truly believes that he is a woman and he truly is going through this transition uh, process, I also know that he has a background in acting. Like only the best of the best actors and singers really make it to Broadway. Like he was in Book of Mormon as I think like a main cast member. So really talented. I also think, so because of that, like I think that he's really good at playing a character. And I think his like, um, soft, delicate, doe-eyed flower character that he puts on that when he like does those uh, videos talking about how he's a victim of transphobia XYZ, I think that is a character. I think that there is probably a lot going on behind the scenes in this person's mind and this person's life that would disturb us if we knew. I don't, that's just what it seems. That's how it appears to me. Um, okay, so I, I should have played this a couple minutes ago, but I just realized that we do have a, a clip of him being afraid of bugs and hiking and high heels. It's, you know, just typical Saturday for us girls, right? Here he is. Day 66, being a girl, and today I'm in nature. Trees, I love them. Water, lakes, I love them. Heels, they're my hiking heels. I love them. Okay, come on. Ah, okay, ah. Okay. So. I don't know. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but he went from a Broadway actor to just a broad. I don't know if I can ha, say that in a ha, room full ha, of women. Ha, 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 ha. That's a good one. That's a good one. I wish I had thought of it myself, Dylan. I wish I had thought of it myself. The better Dylan, the preferred Dylan at Relatable. Yeah. Oh, just to be clear for everyone listening, it is not Dylan Mulvaney on the mic. It is a different Dylan. Um, all right. Uh, okay. And then we had, this was in October, but because we're talking about like his transition diary starting in March, um, I'll play this little clip from a couple months ago where he says that he wants to be a mom. And now I know I can find love. I know I can still be a performer. I know that I can have, I want to have a family. I want to be a mom one day. Yeah. And I absolutely can. All right. So he wants to be a mom one day. We responded to that at the time. Look, you can be a dad. You'd probably be a great dad. Um, but you can't ever be a mom. You can't be a mom via adoption. Can't be a mom in any way um, because you are a man and men cannot be moms. And there's nothing rude about that. There's nothing mean about that. I think that he is made in the image of God. He is just as valuable as... You and me, he's a human being, um, but God made him a man and God didn't make a mistake when he made his body, when he knit his DNA together in his mother's womb. That was very purposeful. That's the Christian belief that Genesis 127 says that God made us male and female. Not only does the Bible tell us that, but biology tells us that. And to try to suppress that or change that or manipulate that in any way, it's not just damaging for the individual, it's damaging for a society. Society seeks uh, needs, distinctions, and definitions, and order. And one of the most basic orderings of things is the reality of male and female. We didn't even have to contrive that or come up with that on our own. God just gave it to us. We need order. We need things that distinguish one from the other. We need categories. That's how societies are built. And we don't do well with chaos and gender ideology is is chaos, not just for one person's soul, but again, for society as a whole. Um, and then along these lines, we also had the don't say gay so-called bill. We covered this a lot at the time and actually just the other day. I don't really know why. Media Matters, who, I mean, they're just obsessed with me. Maybe I should send them a Christmas card or something, or I should have. Um, they wrote an article talking about how I supported or support Ron DeSantis and supported the um, parental rights and education bill. Like you'll remember this was such 
a big thing at the time that the left was absolutely freaking out about, that the media at the time were all freaking out about, that he is banning the word gay, which wasn't true at all. The parental rights and education bill, as we talked about, was just the prohibition on teachers, kindergarten through third grade, hosting formal classroom discussions on sexuality and so-called gender identity. Uh, That is so non-controversial that I am embarrassed for our country that we even need a piece of legislation saying that. Like, I don't care how you identify or what your sexual preference is. We can't agree on that. And I know there are some people who identify themselves as LGBTQ who do agree with that, who don't want to go into the classroom and talk to kids about their genitalia and talk to kids about these very sensitive subjects. They are, in a lot of ways, complicated subjects. The only person that needs to be talking to kids about those things, if and when and how they want to, is the parent in this child's life. So the fact that this was controversial at all, I think it revealed a lot about the left. And it also showed this conflation that only the left is doing. The right, I don't think, is doing this. The conflation between um, uh, demonizing, rightfully, criticizing pedophilia and demonizing LGBTQ people. Why is saying, hey, you can't talk about this stuff in kindergarten through third grade, which I think it should be all the way through 12th grade, by the way. But you can't talk about this to little kids. Why is that the same as being anti-gay? You tell me. Are you saying that gay people have to talk to a five-year-old about like how their genitalia doesn't match their brain? Like, what? So that was revealing. There were some tweets about this. Jack uh, Cochiarella, these are all like left-wing kind of viral tweets that that went out. Ron DeSantis says Disney crossed a line by denouncing the Don't Say Gay bill. I think Ron DeSantis crossed a line by signing the Don't Say Gay bill. Um, Again, it's called Parental Rights and Education. You'll remember the whole drama with Disney taking a stand against this. And then when it was actually signed, saying that they're going to do everything to make sure that it's overturned. And Ron DeSantis and the Florida legislature responded by saying, "Okay, we're going to take away your Uh, tax privileges when it comes to your zone in Florida, which I think was absolutely the right move. They didn't take away their rights. They took away a privilege um, that they had had. And Disney, a major, huge, powerful corporation, said that they were going to work against the democratic will of the people of Florida to get a law overturned that was duly created and um, and signed a by Florida legislators and the Florida governor. So that was a problem. So I think he used the power available to him to uh, protect the people of Florida. That's absolutely what he should do. David Hogg said, let's make the don't say gay bill cost DeSantis his career. Homophobia belongs in our history books, not power. (laughs) That did not happen. Ron DeSantis completely trounced the competition in Florida. And he turned a light blue slash purple state into a red state. So didn't happen, Dave. I was uh, I was about to say that'll make a really good um, how it started, how it's going meme when DeSantis wins the Republican uh, primary. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, it would have, and you could already you could just go ahead and make the meme from what David Hogg said at the beginning of the year to what actually happened in November in Florida. Yep. George Takai, Ron DeSantis just signed the Florida Don't Say Gay, Don't Say Trans bill. Doesn't have the same ring to it, George. Uh, Into law. Ron DeSantis is garbage. Hmm. Occupy Democrats. A great account. If you want to have a difficult time distinguishing between reality and satire. Breaking in a huge slap. In a huge slap in the fact Oh, I think they meant to say face, LOL. And a huge slap in the face to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and his don't say gay bill. New York City announces that it's putting up dozens of rainbow studded digital billboards that say the word gay all over five of Florida's largest cities. RT to think New York City. This is what I'm talking about. It's really hard to distinguish between satire and reality when it comes to this account. Also, is this the same New York City that said that they didn't have the resources to deal with all of the illegal immigrants 
there. Maybe they shouldn't have been sending rainbow billboards to Florida to make a point that no one really understands. Um, so that was March. And then also we have this nice little clip from Ron DeSantis that people were very upset about, but I like it. So we'll bring it back um, where he talks to the kids behind him in like a photo and he's like, mm, no more masks. Thanks. You do not have to wear those masks. I mean, please take them off. <laughs> Honestly, it's not doing anything, and we got to stop with this COVID theater. So if you want to wear it, fine, but this is a, this is ridiculous. All right. I love it. I love how genuinely annoyed he is by it. Like, you can really tell. I mean, this is a battle that DeSantis has been fighting and wanted to fight uh, for a really long time. And he recently announced... What was it? Can someone look this up for me? I'll come back to it. Like a loss. What was it? A lawsuit against the vaccine manufacturers. Um, I'll come back to that after uh, they look it up. And then in April, we don't have too much. I'm sure there were more things that happened in April, but we just can't get through all of them. But April was Easter. And then we have this amazing clip of our formidable president, Joe Biden, not knowing what is happening and if the Easter Bunny is real or not. Thank you and happy, happy Easter. <laughs> All right. Wait. Wait. Okay, so if you didn't catch that, that is Dr. Jill Biden telling her husband she's going wave, wave, because I guess that's just what she has to do. She's got to tell. Uh, she's got to tell her husband how to how to function. Um, also, okay, so back to the uh, back to the Governor DeSantis thing. He made the announcement following a roundtable with Florida Surgeon General Joseph Ladapo and a panel of scientists and physicians in which some discussions centered on the fact that pharmaceutical companies have not provided their data on the COVID-19 vaccines to independent researchers will be able to get the data whether they want to give it or not to Santa said in Florida. It is illegal to mislead and represent, especially when you're talking about the efficacy of a drug. So I think this is a good move by DeSantis. Um, you'll remember that Trump was in charge of Operation Warp Speed and really took credit for a lot of that and even praised Johnson & Johnson as recently as a few months ago. So I'm not saying that Ron DeSantis is running for president, but I think that this is just kind of like a, it's a good way to distinguish himself um, among Republicans um, by fighting against a vaccine that is very unpopular among conservatives. So that was something that happened recently, but that was connected to the clip that we just played uh, about DeSantis that happened back in um, back in March. And then, all right, we move on to May. May was a crazy month. We had um, the Evalde shooting in Evalde, Texas that happened in May. An 18-year-old killed 21 people, 19 children, two teachers. You'll remember the husband of one of the teachers died of a fatal heart attack the next day, leaving behind their four children. I mean, it just doesn't get more heartbreaking than that. The shooter shot um, his grandmother as well. And I believe his grandmother survived. Um, the shooter is deceased, was shot and killed by Border Patrol. Now you'll remember how strange this was and how many videos we saw afterwards of police just not going in, waiting for backup. Um, even though there were a lot of police officers there, there's literally that video going around of a police officer like standing outside while the murders are going on, like getting some hand sanitizer. And it was a total failure of leadership by Evalde police. And there were still some commentators after all this information was coming out saying, oh, no, we have to defend them. You know, we don't uh, No, they did the right thing or the media is not reporting the truth on this. You literally called me by name a fake conservative for just raising some questions about uh, the response to this and said that I call myself a Christian. Uh, what? Because I didn't think that the Uvalde police uh, protected these children enough and it was ultimately ultimately Border Patrol that did something. Um, at least three police officers initially followed Ramos, who was the killer, into the building within minutes, but failed to engage him. In the next half hour, as many as 19 officers piled into a school hallway, but were told by 
um, Orodondo, who is the police chief, to stand down, believing that the shooter had barricaded himself inside a classroom and that children were no longer um, under an active threat. That decision, however, left Ramos free to carry out his attack within one fourth grade classroom. Stephen McCraw, the director of Texas Department of Public Safety, said during a contentious news conference on Friday, another 47 minutes passed before a Border Patrol tactical team breached the classroom door and shot and killed Ramos. And a lot of people are there. Um, they don't really believe what Orodondo is saying that, oh, we thought that he was barricaded in a classroom and not doing anything because gunshots were probably heard. There was also a little child in that classroom calling his or her mother. I don't remember if it was a boy or a girl. You'll remember the mother who was trying to rush into uh, the school to get her children. She was then detained. She was held back. But then parents were able to run into the school and to get their children and get out safely. So you're telling me that these unarmed parents were able to do that, but these armed police officers weren't. So I think there's still a lot of disturbing questions surrounding this. Again, this guy who was the shooter, he had had um, a storied past, uh, fatherless, not even living with his parents at the time. He had been inflicting violence on animals. Um, and so there was a lot that told us that, okay, there are red flags here. This person should not be, uh, should not be free. Like you sh certainly shouldn't be able to have these kinds of weapons. So, um, still very tragic. And still these parents who are dealing with this, just like parents who deal with any kind of loss, but especially in these kinds of tragedies, like we stopped talking about it. We moved on to the next thing, but they didn't. This is still obviously the biggest thing that happened to them this year. Those little four children whose mom was shot and killed and whose dad died out of a heart attack the next day, they are spending their first Christmas without their parents. Their first Christmas is orphans. And then you've got all of these parents who are spending their first Christmas without their children. Um, I mean, just it's just unthinkable how uh, tragic this is. And then we also had the Buffalo shooter who shot up a grocery store in Buffalo, um, New York, who was um, reportedly an actual white supremacist who was trying to target a minority. So another absolute um, tragedy there. I mean, the area has all of the gun laws that it can possibly have to try to restrict something like this from happening. And unfortunately, that evil was still carried out. Then in May, there was the Dobbs decision leak, the Dobbs uh, v. Jackson Women's Health Center decision that ended up overturning Roe v. Wade. Um, you'll also remember how wild this was and what a reaction that it caused when Alito's arguments um, were interpreted as uh, the overturning of Roe. I mean, people, la -ha lost their minds. Uh, we have some clips from protests. Here's the first one. So if you didn't see that, if you're not watching on YouTube, I mean, these were protests that were happening outside of the homes of these Supreme Court justices. There were lots of tweets uh, threatening violence and saying that they have no right to privacy. They have no right to safety because if abortions aren't safe, then neither are they. We saw all kinds of vandalism of pro-life pregnancy centers that happened over the next few months. As far as we know, there have been no arrests that have been made. Um, if we can find those pictures, we should put them up of different pregnancy centers that were firebombed, that were threatened, and that were vandalized. I mean, people absolutely freaked out about the potential of Roe v. Wade being overturned, which would simply 
which did simply send the abortion decision back to the states. It just shows you that violence begets violence. People who want to be able to be free to kill unborn children. Of course, why wouldn't they be violent towards people outside of the womb? The only difference is size, age, location. Um, all right. And then in June, uh, we had the actual overturning of Roe v. Wade. And let me just read you the reaction to that. We didn't know when it was actually going to uh, be overturned, but it was. And this was like a an amazing day. It was an amazing day when I thought that Roe was going to be overturned. And it was an amazing day when um, it was actually overturned. This was something that people fought for for 49 years, the torch was passed from one generation of pro-life activists to the other. There was so much unseen and unsung work being done by Christians in particular to help women who needed it, to adopt these children, to foster these children, and to get women connected to the resources that they needed. There were groups who were working to... Um, influence legislators to write laws that would make its way to the Supreme Court to elect Republicans that would then appoint these kinds of judges and justices that would make pro-life, aka constitutional decisions. It was 49 years of work and persistence, and something happened that we never thought would happen by the justice and the grace and the providence of God. Roe v. Wade was overturned so that laws that recognize the rights and the dignity of unborn children could be passed in particular states. I mean, praise God for that. Praise God for that. That's why the culture wars matter. That's why politics matter, because things can actually change. And so Roe v. Wade overturned June 24th. And uh, Justice Thomas, I think, has a really great concurrence when he says, I join the opinion of the court because it correctly holds that there is no constitutional right to abortion. Respondents invoke one source for that right. The 14th Amendment's guarantee that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty or property without due process of law. The court well explains why under our substantive due process precedents, the purported right to abortion is not a form of li liberty protected by the due process clause. Such a right is neither deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition nor implicitly in the concept of ordered liberty. Um, Twitter reactions, Abby Martin said, millions will be forced into motherhood because of six unelected religious extremists. Uh, who do you think decided Roe? Who do you think decided Roe 50 years ago? I mean, there were a bunch of unelected men that decided Roe. A minority right wing is ascendant and useless Democrats will only use this war on our rights to fundraise, not fight. Um, Emmanuel Macron, abortion, who is the head of France, abortion is a fundamental right for all women. It must be protected. I wish to express my solidarity with the women whose liberties are being undermined. LOL. The Mississippi law that the Supreme Court upheld today bans abortion after 15 weeks. Michael Tracy says France bans abortion after 12 weeks. Our abortion laws in the United States are uniquely radical. Um, and then a bunch of uh, corporations said that they were going to pay for abortions, Disney, Expedia, Dick Sporting Goods, PayPal, Bank of America, Patagonia, Tesla, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Airbnb, all kinds, um, which is really frightening. Then there were continued protests. You'll also remember that there was a man who traveled from California to Virginia to attack uh, to attack Kavanaugh. He was setting out to assassinate Kavanaugh, apparently, and he was apprehended by authorities. Thankfully, Libs of TikTok tweeted that there's a TikToker that posted all of the addresses of the Supreme Court justices. And um, then someone commented, the top comment apparently on that TikTok um, was describing how to make a pipe bomb to throw at these justices' houses. I mean, imagine loving killing children that much that you are willing to murder the Supreme Court justices who simply said that it's up to the states. Really wild. Carlos Meza said, I mean, this is a guy who is, I believe this, this is the guy who's the son of millionaires who says that he's a communist. Duh. Uh, the suffragettes plan a bombs, queer people through bricks. Violence has always been a necessary and important part of social justice. Probably always has been a necessary part of social justice. Social justice is toxic. Um, <laughs> uh, he says violence is a legitimate and appropriate response to, um, oppression. 
Is it is it oppression to say that children have a right not to be dismembered? All kinds of calls for riots and things like that. Some people said that this was the reason why the red wave didn't really materialize as much as we thought that it would. Maybe so. There's a lot of misinformation you'll remember about banning miscarriages and things like that. Um, of course, all of those things were propaganda as we talked about at the time. Um, and then this, okay, we're good. Sorry, we're going to speed up a little bit because this is, I know that it's long. There's so many stories. And then the Ghislaine Maxwell, she was sentenced also in June. Remember that crazy story? I think that people have forgot about. It. She was sentenced to 20 years in prison for conspiring with Jeffrey Epstein to sexually abuse minors. What do y'all think about the Ghislaine Maxwell story. Have any conspiracy theories to share with us? Do you have any conspiracy theories? No. I feel like it's less of a conspiracy theory, but I'm just really frustrated that there's still like there aren't there's still our names, right? Right. What's that about? Like who <laughs> went to the island? What other arrests are being made? Yeah. Who was a part of this? Yeah. yeah. So some something shady is going on. Well, I think some people would say that the authorities are trying to protect themselves because there are so many powerful people involved in this. Yeah. Probably yeah. not a conspiracy theory. Probably yeah. true. I mean, with all the intelligence that our intelligence agencies have to spy on Americans, not only do we not know everyone who was involved with Epstein going to Epstein Island. I mean, remember that? I don't think we have the clip, but that really awkward interview with Bill Gates when he was asked by a reporter like his relationship with uh, Jeffrey Epstein. It was super awkward. With all the intelligence that we have, we apparently can't get any answers on that. We also still don't know who leaked the Dobb decision. I forgot to mention that there was a leaker. And I think that goes to show that it was probably a clerk for one of the liberal justices. But we still don't know. We still don't know the answer to that, which I think is really odd. In July, we had my personal hero and a social justice hero in general, um, arrested for very, very, very bravely protesting. Let's see, hang on. What was she protesting? Oh, she's protesting abortion. for um, abortion. She was violently and brutally arrested. You guys might remember that disturbing video. Here we go. So awkwardly, like sauntering off so slowly. Um, and she had like held her hands behind her back. And then there were images of her and I think uh, whatever her name is, uh, not, not Rashida, Ilhan Omar. Ilhan Omar. And you can only see them from the front. And it looks like they're actually getting arrested because their hands are behind their back. But there are no handcuffs. There's no handcuffs there. Um, I also was violently arrested that day. Uh, here's that. Scariest day of my life. And I, like AOC, in the month of July, needed to wear a thick coat um, because it gets cold in jail. And I knew that was my fate, just like it was AOC's fate. Um, and then, let's see, in June, or no, wait, no, we're in July. We're in July. The Respect for Marriage Act was introduced, which was just signed. I think we spent probably enough time on the Respect for Marriage Act that we don't need to get into all of that right now. But that was the beginning of that. And then also Media Matters started um, one of their, it's just their like thread of obsessions with me um, by dedicating an entire hit piece to me, Ali Beth Sucky teeters between culture war crusader and fundamentalist Christian. They actually inspired my Twitter bio. They called me a pastel hate influencer that is attracting a young audience through an Instagrammable aesthetic. Uh, I try. I try. I don't think I could have come up with a better a, a better description of this podcast. Um, <laughs> Stucky regularly spews hateful misinformation about LGBTQ people on her relatable podcast, hosting anti-LGBTQ guests and pushing far right talking points. One of the things um, that they included that I that I loved 
Oh, this is funny. Stucky's bright pink Twitter header, Instagrammable set decorations, and aesthetic podcast are apparel. Are apparel and are sorry, aesthetic podcast apparel are in stark relief against the backdrop of the virulently anti-LGBTQ rhetoric that fuels her extremist right wing view. And one of my favorite things that they said. She uh, is, she said, being a biological mother is the best thing she has done other than being a follower of Christ and a wife to my husband. That is so evil and terrible. Um, they actually did like put all of my comments at this conference where I said that in there that I actually appreciate because I meant them that every woman has not only the capability, but also being a the also the calling to be a mother that doesn't necessarily mean a biological mother it could be in a mentorship role a spiritual mother but i do believe that we all have the capability and the responsibility to mother in some way media matters was very upset um about uh about that my researcher put in here i take personal offense to the thought that you would be spreading misinformation especially since i find a lot of sources for you that's right we're not in the business of spreading misinformation um okay leah thomas uh some of this story also happened in july like you'll remember back in march um that he competes as a woman for the university of pennsylvania became the first openly transgender woman that is the phrase the phrase that the new york times use uses to win an ncaa swimming championship and then in july leah thomas was nominated for woman of the year even though he is not a woman, can never be a woman, will never be a woman, didn't actually end up winning. But there's that. Um, and then also in July, this was a big month. The Daily Dot reported that a political meme subreddit kicked off an internet wide call to get baseless groomer claims classified as hate speech. And so as we've talked about many times with James Lindsay, he started this thing saying, okay, groomer, whenever people were going to bat for the idea that we should be talking to kids about changing their gender and sexuality and all of those things, especially in schools, it was a play off the okay boomer meme. And so Twitter literally started banning accounts, suspending accounts that called people and called this kind of behavior grooming and they called it anti-LGBTQ, which again is just very odd because they weren't going around and calling gay people groomers or even people who call themselves trans groomers. They were saying if you're talking to kids about this stuff and they're not your own kids and you're not doing it like in a, you know, healthy way out of love for them, you're just you're trying to groom them ideologically or in some cases sexually, then yeah, you're a groomer. Literally kicked off of Twitter for that. And now we know after Elon Musk has taken over, now we know that they protected child sex abuse material and did nothing almost to restrict the distribution of this kind of material. So it almost seems like it was intentional. They don't like to be called what they are and they're afraid of the stigma um, around sexualizing children because they like to sexualize children. So that was wild. Okay, let me tell y'all about Cozy Earth. I love Cozy Earth sheets. Also, their pajamas and loungewear, all amazing because they're made out of the best and the softest and the most temperature regulating material out there. We've got different kinds of sheets. We've got kind of like your cheap low end sheets and then we've got some in between, but then we have our cozy earth sheets. And our cozy earth sheets are like some of the best things that we own. This is a great wedding present, by the way. You should get the couple of the wedding that you're going to a really nice set of sheets from Cozy Earth because this is like a difference maker, game changer when it comes to how well you sleep. They're so comfortable. I love them year round. Um, they are super breathable because they're made of this premium viscose from Bamboo. Also, they just sent me this like pajama top that I love. I have a loungewear, um, a loungewear where set from them. I just love Cozy Earth products so much. You can go to CozyEarth.com slash Allie and save 35% on your order. It's a really good deal. 
be sure to enter my promo code Ali at checkout to save 35%, all backed by a 100 night sleep guarantee. So if you sleep on these sheets and for whatever crazy reason you don't like them, you're like, oh no, I like scratchy sheets instead, then you can send them back. But I know that you're going to love them. CozyEarth.com slash Allie for 35% off. Use code Allie at checkout. CozyEarth.com slash Allie. CozyEarth.com slash Allie. All right, moving on to August, Fauci stepped down as director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, He said that he was hinting for some time that he was going to do that. He's 81. And so it was just time for him to step down after he has been made into a saint, a votive candle, some kind of hero. But of course, we believe that he was a spreader of misinformation that his flip flopping led to policy, which then led to the robbing of livelihoods of people and the childhoods of millions of kids. And they'll never be able to get that back. Um, And so he's been wrong so much and in such consequential ways. I don't think he should go down as a hero, but, you know, in our bureaucracy, you get rewarded for being wrong and you never are held accountable for it. Also, in, uh, in August, at the beginning of August, the FBI raided Trump's home at Mar-a-Lago saying that they needed documents that were apparently taken out of the White House after his time at, um, as president. Um, that compromised our national security. But there was a lot of people calling BS on that. A lot of people saying, is that really true? Or is this just Joe Biden weaponizing the DOJ against his potential presidential opponent in 2024? And so we had a whole big episode on that. A lot of people were like, oh my gosh, it's starting. Like this is actually a form of fascism. But there's been a lot that's come out since then and a lot of debate and discussion about whether or not the FBI raiding his home was really justified. Um, And then let's see, uh, we had... A few other things happened in August. We had our top viewed episode ever on YouTube. Uh, Sophia Galvin, a former, um, uh, a, f- uh, a former person who identified as transgender, someone who tried to transition from female to male, who then detransitioned and became a Christian and is now talking about that process and is sharing her faith. Really amazing interview. I think it has, at least right now as I'm recording, over 400,000 views. Um, And so I'm so thankful for that. I hope so many lives have been changed because of her boldness and because of how God is using her. So that's exciting. And then we had that volleyball racial slur hoax. Remember that? That Duke University's volleyball team accused Brigham Young uh, young students at a volleyball game of calling a black player in uh, for Duke University the N-word. And then there was video footage that came out that showed that no one was saying that. That wasn't heard anywhere. It was also just not plausible that people would be bold enough to say something like that and that no one would be reacting come on but then the girl who accused some students of this her god her godmother was tweeting about it saying that this is uh saying that this really happened and that there needs to be some kind of legal effort against them and it ended up just being a false claim. A video of the entire game was posted on YouTube and does not appear to show anyone yelling slurs at any point, and no cell phone footage has surfaced. I mean, come on. It's just so crazy how many of these race hate crime hoaxes um, turn out to, or how many of these like alleged race race hate crimes turn out to be hoaxes turn out to be perpetrated by the very people who are accusing someone of perpetrating this um, against them. I think that goes to show that victim status pays in the United States. Like if you're going to go through all the trouble of making something up like this, um, it's not because you're actually oppressed, but because you know oppression grants you a certain status that you are coveting. 
Um, so I think that that knowledge should probably flavor our commentary when we are looking at future allegations of these kinds of hate crimes. Doesn't mean that they're all false. Doesn't mean that they never happen. Doesn't mean that we should never believe the people making these allegations. But we should take all of the accusations with a grain of salt. Um, and then we've got September. This was Martha's Vineyard Gate. You'll remember that. Um, And not only Martha's Vineyard, but the red states were sending the illegal migrants to the blue states who said that they were sanctuary cities and sanctuary states. And they said that they wanted all of these illegal migrants to come. And the D.C. mayor said, we do not have the resources. And then um, the New York mayor said, we do not have the resources. We don't have the places for, we don't have the place for all of these people. Um, And then Ron DeSantis decided to do the epic move of sending them to Martha's Vineyard, who called themselves a sanctuary area. Lots of money, lots of space, lots of vacant homes, by the way. Um, And so they sent them right along on a bus, a voluntary program to Martha's Vineyard, And uh, here's a Martha's Vineyard resident saying, "Mm, diversity might be a strength, but not for us. So what are the most difficult challenges right now? The difficult challenges are uh, we have at some point in time, they have to move to somewhere else. Right. We we cannot we don't have the services to take care of 50 immigrants. um, And we we certainly don't have housing. We're in a housing crisis as we are on this island. And so we we don't we can't house everyone here that lives here and works here. We don't have housing for 50 more people. So why did you call yourself a sanctuary city, a sanctuary area? Because you knew that it wasn't going to happen because you live in an elite island that most people don't have easy access to. And so you did it to virtue signal. Uh, You can get the resources. Brown, Texas also doesn't have the resources. These Florida towns don't have the resources. These border towns in Arizona and California and Texas, they don't have the resources to care for these illegal migrants either. I guarantee you probably have more resources than they do. These are poor towns that cannot support the thousands and thousands and thousands of migrants that have come into their cities. And you criticize them for voting Republican. You criticize them for saying, hey, we can't help all of these people. We want our communities back. We want our towns back. We want to feel safe and secure. We want to have a country again. And yet when you're met with the crisis that you are belittling, you say, oh, we don't have the time. We don't have the resources. I think that DeSantis made a really good point um, with all of that. I know people were kicking and screaming about it, but I think that he made an important point that you want diversity for thee, but not for me. Um, All right. You'll also remember this. We've got the fake boob teacher stating that he is trans. Now, is this real? Is this not real? I don't know. But he's wearing these ridiculously large prosthetic breasts and he's teaching woodshop, I guess, in Canada. I mean, this is a form of sexual harassment to young boys, as I said at the time. Um, I, uh, Oakville Trafalgar High School, they issued a statement saying that they support, that they support him, actually, and that there's no problem with this. So I, whether he was faking it or not, the school really did support him. Um, all and right. also, yeah. on that note, they um, have now made it, they're threatening students with suspension if they take photos of it. So the students aren't even allowed to, like, take Talk photos. About it. Yeah, to share it with people. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, they're fake boobs, like without a bra on. And it's a man. It's a man. It's a man wearing this. In a wood shop class. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to take photos. I mean, it's a fetish for him. It's a fetish for him. He gets off on this. And apparently, we are supposed to allow people to live out f- their fetishes publicly. It's a protected class. A fetish is now a protected class in the United States. And we're supposed to call it identity. And we have to abide by it no matter how uncomfortable it makes us feel it's so sad it feels so bad for the young boys and there i also saw like some footage of this person skydiving recently very strange all right so we're in september a couple big things happened the um biden speech where he was in front of independence hall in philadelphia you'll remember that he's flanked by members of our military saying that MAGA Republicans are anti-democracy, that they're enemies of democracy, and um, that they're that they're in a battle for the soul 
of the nation. This was very, very strange. We'll put up a picture, but behind him is like a wall bathed in red. Yeah, very demonic looking. And the most divisive speech probably in all of American presidential history, way worse, way more uh, dogmatic than anything Trump ever said, way more divisive, way more violence inducing than anything Biden ever said. And by the way, I don't even know if all of this is included, but there has been plenty of political violence against Republicans and conservatives this year. There was the 83 year old in Michigan who was shot in the back by a pro-choicer as she was canvassing for uh, for pro-lifers just a couple months ago. There was Kaylor Ellingson, I believe it was in South Dakota, who was murdered by a guy because he said that, um, the guy said that he thought that this guy was some like right winger or something like that. And so whether that can be tied directly to Biden's speech, I don't know. I'm sure that a lot of the just vitriolic, hateful, and deceitful rhetoric that we hear um, from a lot of people on the left doesn't help the situation, certainly. And I will I will stand by this. It's way worse than rhetoric that you hear on the right. Way worse. Um, and just way more pervasive, too, and way more mainstream. And so here's a short clip of Biden's speech. And here, in my view, is what is true. MAGA Republicans do not respect the Constitution. They do not believe in the rule of law. They do not recognize the will of the people. What? What? I don't, I mean, basically just casting everyone, he goes on in that to basically lump everyone who is pro-life into that. So they're an enemy of the country. And what do you do to enemies? Yikes. Also, on September 8th, Queen Elizabeth died. The UK's longest serving monarch died at Balmoral on uh, age 96 after reigning for 70 years. There was a there were a lot of hot takes after that. Some people celebrating her death, saying that she was some kind of, you know, evil colonizer and things like that. And then others saying that she was the unifier of the UK. Then it's a very sad day. Most people were saying things like that. Um, and so sad, but uh, a long life well lived. And then also um, in October, the a, um, pro-lifers were arrested and raided. You'll remember that Mark Hawk, he was a Catholic pro-life activist. His home was raided and FBI agents rammed into his home when all of his little children were standing there absolutely petrified and demanding uh, to see him. This is after he peacefully protested at a an abortion center in Philadelphia and a man harassed and got into the face of his son saying sexually explicit things to his son. And so Mark Hawk simply pushed him back. Well, this is the federal government saying, oh, no, this was a form of assault and you were trying to prevent someone from accessing abortion. That's not what was happening. There were several, uh, several other people who were um, indicted as well, not just and not just there, but also in uh, the state of Tennessee, and they are facing up to eleven years in prison. We also interviewed someone who was being indicted on the Face Act, Freedom uh, of Access to Clinic Entrances Act of nineteen ninety four. It's a very obscure law; has rarely ever been enforced. But this is um, who Biden is. He is uh, his administration is extremely fascistic. You'll remember that. The DOJ has not just gone after Trump, is not just going after pro-lifers, but um, has also planned to go after parents who complain at school board meetings. So they're completely political and ideological and uh, corrupt. Uh, And then we also have in October the Paul Pelosi story, October 28th, the very strange story where David DePape was accused of attacking Paul Pelosi with a hammer. After breaking into the Pelosi San Francisco home, there were a lot of theories about what was really going on there. They were both in their underwear. Apparently, Paul Pelosi like told um, uh, told the police officers while the pape was there that everything was fine, and so it was very strange. And then um, there was that story of the NBC reporter who was who 
reported uh, about the incongruencies with this story, that maybe this wasn't a random attack, that Paul Pelosi seemed to not want authorities to help him while the pape was there. And that reporter, the story ended up getting taken down and that reporter ended up being suspended, which was very, very strange. So there's a fly in the buttermilk here, as we say in the South, there's something going on that we don't really understand. I mean, this guy, David DePape, was apparently an illegal immigrant. He was apparently a pedophile. He lived in San Francisco in a place that had a bunch of pride and BLM flags, but also he believed a lot of strange conspiracy theories, like almost QAnon-esque. He wasn't stable, and yet the left was constantly pinning it on the right, saying that this is like right-wing violence. I mean, pretty amazing if you can uh, say that a San Francisco illegal immigrant pro BLM and pride flag waving guy attacking Paul Pelosi is a right wing extremist incident. Very strange. And then also we've got Elon buying Twitter on October 27th. Elon Musk completed a $44 billion deal to own Twitter, immediately firing four top Twitter execs, including the CEO and CFO. Um, Donald Trump's was Donald Trump's account restored? Yeah, uh, his, I guess it was. Yeah, he's just not using it. Yeah. Um, he restored several big accounts. Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Andrew Tate, Jordan Peterson, the Babylon Bee, Kathy Griffin, Kanye West. Kanye West's time on on October ended, as we will talk, or on Twitter ended pretty quickly after this. And so this was something I never really thought was going to happen, and it did end up happening. So that was that was a pleasant surprise. Um, in November, we had the election. The red wave did not materialize quite as much as we thought that it would. John Fetterman, someone who cannot physically speak, uh, beat Dr. Oz in the Pennsylvania Senate race. I always thought that Dr. Oz was a bad candidate, though. I always thought he was a bad candidate. He was way too liberal. And would I have preferred him over Fetterman? Yes, but he was way too slick. He seemed like a carpetbagger. And I just didn't think that he was a good choice. And we had Trump and other members of the media trying to hoist him up and to lie about his primary opponents. I thought that was very sketchy and disturbing. Um, And then we have uh, Trump announcing his presidential run. On November 15th, which came as a surprise to no one. He alluded to that even on my podcast last year. Um, And then we had the whole FTX thing that happened in November when Sam Bankman-Fried was charged with orchestrating a, a scheme to defraud equity investors in FTX Trading Limited. He also... He raised more than or he also raised a lot of money and gave a lot of money to Democrats, some Republicans, but mostly uh, Democrats. He was also supporting um, Ukrainian endeavors, as we talked about a few weeks ago. And so there is a strange scheme going on here. He was also just arrested. I believe it was in the Bahamas. Um, And then we had the whole Kanye West saga in November and December. Um, he appeared on Tucker's show, uh, on October 6th to discuss the decision to wear a white lives matter shirt in Paris fashion week. And then he talked about in some footage that wasn't aired about, uh, Jews being the real black people, uh, or the black people being the real Jews. And he has said that in other places as well. He posted um, on October 7th that he was going to go death con um, three on Jewish people. Very strange thing happening. And then there was then it goes into November with the Trump dinner, which we discussed with Nick Fuentes. And then there was the Tim cast interview and then there was the Alex Jones interview, all of which uh, in all of which he said that basically that Jewish people have kind of screwed him over. He also said on the Alex Jones show that he loves Nazis and that he loves Hitler. Um, he got suspended from Twitter after posting a, a swastika within a star of David, which is also like part of a like cult symbol. I think it's called the Raelian uh, cult, which we kind of tied together a few weeks ago. Um, too. 
He announced that he was running for president and Milo Yiannopoulos was running his campaign. But Milo Yiannopoulos stepped down after some texts came out that showed that Milo, Milo Yiannopoulos was apparently calling Kanye West gay. Very strange. Very strange. Um, another strange thing that we've talked about for the past uh, few weeks that is actually more of a December story. So we can transition into December now was Sam Britton, the Biden nuclear official that was uh, he was fired after being charged with stealing women's luggage at multiple airports across the country. This is a very strange guy who hosted BDSM workshops at various places. He never should have been hired. It was very obvious that he was unstable from the beginning. He is now facing federal charges for these things. I feel badly for the women whose luggage and jewelry and all of that and clothes that he stole. And then, of course, we had the big Balenciaga story, which we covered extensively on this podcast, where they posted photos of children holding these bears that were dressed in BDSM gear. And then they had in other campaigns hidden Supreme Court cases having to do with child pornography, child sex abuse material. And uh, they also had some other like very strange things in the backgrounds of their photos, like different books and things like that, that seem to allude to the normalization of the sexualization of children. There were all different kinds of statements, conflicting statements that came out um, from Balenciaga about this. I still think that they need to be investigated here. Not enough celebrities that have ties to them have said anything about it. Again, very dark, just how mainstream the objectification of children has become. And then in December, we have the Twitter files, which we discussed with Oren McIntyre a couple weeks ago, and uh, just uh, showing the collusion between Twitter and the federal government to try to su- suppress information either about Hunter Biden or about COVID or about uh, people who identify as transgender. And so the very people who call people on the right fascists were cheering on the collusion between a major company and the federal government to silence dissent. I think that's a great part of Elon taking over Twitter. And I also think that um, his removal of child sex abuse material from Twitter makes his takeover alone worth it. And then we have perhaps the biggest story of the year uh, that Donald Trump, he teased a major announcement. He said, I have a huge announcement. It's going to be huge. And we were all like, whoa, what's this huge announcement? He's already said that he's running for president. Is he going to say he's not running for president? What's a huge announcement? Who's your VP pick? What's going on? It's going to be like some major thing. It's going to be some policy proposal. What is it? It wasn't. He announced trading cards. And we'll put up the picture. He announced digital trading cards. An NFT featuring Trump's face on the bodies of superheroes. Here's the video. Hello, everyone. This is Donald Trump. Hopefully your favorite president of all time. Better than Lincoln. Better than Washington. With an important announcement to make. I'm doing my first official Donald J. Trump NFT collection right here and right now. They're called Trump Digital Trading Cards. These cards feature some of the really incredible artwork pertaining to my life and my career. It's been very exciting. You can collect your Trump Digital Cards just like a baseball card or other collectibles. Here's one of the best parts. Each card comes with an automatic chance to win amazing prizes like dinner with me. I don't know if that's an amazing prize, but it's what we have. Or golf with you and a group of your friends at one of my beautiful golf courses, and they are beautiful. Okay, so there it is, $99 for his trading cards. I don't know, I actually just kind of feel bad. Like, I just kind of feel bad for him. I do, I feel bad for him in this case. And I feel bad for the people who just like they can't they can't believe that he would ever do anything wrong. It's just wild. It's just wild. But that was apparently the biggest story, the biggest announcement of the year. Now, as I'm recording this, it is December 16th. So there could be more that happens in the next couple of weeks leading up to when this actually comes out. But that was December 15th. So that's about as much as we can do. There's also like I mean, there is a lot uh, more that we could talk about. We could talk about inflation. We could talk about pit bulls continuing to demolish humans. And we could talk about the food processing plants that have caught on fire and what the heck was going on there and why aren't there more investigations about any of that. 
but we don't have time. This has already been like a mammoth episode, just insanely long. But a lot happened this year, and there was a lot more that we uh, there was a lot more that we didn't even get to cover. Um, all right. That's all I got for today, and I hope you enjoyed our recap, and we will be back here soon. 